I wrote an Amiga program, Padme, for playing synth pads live. In an earlier project that I called the Polimba, I demonstrated that it's possible to get clear, high fidelity sound from an Amiga. That was not my goal this time. Instead, I was trying to recreate a particular lo-fi sound prevalent in Amiga game and demo music from the late 80s and early 90s. I'm talking about short, looped 8-bit chord samples, played at a relatively modest sample rate. These would be rendered by the Amiga hardware as jagged stairways, and all of those sharp edges would create a kind of high-frequency shimmer that hits right in the nostalgia. Now, in a typical Amiga song, there would be a handful of pre-baked chord samples, perhaps a major chord, a minor chord, and a suspended chord and these would then be reused at different pitches throughout the song. The limited selection of chord inversions would form a creative constraint that influenced the composition. But for a live instrument, I wanted something more versatile, ideally supporting a wide range of chord types in all possible inversions and all the 12 keys. So one of the challenges was to fit all of those chord variants into the limited memory available in the machine. But an even bigger challenge was the design of the user interface. You see, we can't just map a single note to each key on the keyboard, like a piano. And there are two reasons for that. One is a phenomenon called keyboard ghosting that prevents the computer from reliably detecting more than two keys pressed at the same time, whereas I want to play chords with three or four notes at the same time. The second reason is that although the Amiga can play up to four samples at the same time, I want to be able to crossfade between two chords, and thus briefly play two chords at the same time, so that leaves only two sound channels per chord. My solution was to map note pairs to the keys. Modifier keys, like Shift, are immune to keyboard ghosting because they're wired differently, so I implemented a mode where you can gate the volume with the left Shift, Alt and Amiga keys. And then I added a vibrato effect on the left mouse button that I can operate with my foot. I can hold the control key for longer attack and release times. And this can be used for crossfades. So each key plays a sample, the sample contains two notes mixed together. And now I'm going to explain how I've organized those note pairs into what I consider to be a musically useful keyboard layout. This sample contains a C and a G, which is called a fifth, one, two, three, four, five, a fifth. But it also includes the same fifth, an octave above, and an octave above that and below, and below that, and so on. And to get this really fat pad sound, I'm using slightly detuned sawtooth waves. Now, all the individual C's and G's are not all the same volume. The closer they are to this part of the keyboard, let's call it the pitch center of gravity, the louder they are. And as you move away from the center of gravity, the notes get fainter and fainter until they're inaudible. And I chose that particular center of gravity because it gives the synth pads a pleasant mid-range timbre. So this is a fifth from C to G that extends to every octave, but equivalently it's a fourth from G to C, one, two, three, four, that extends to every octave. So this one sample can function as a fourth or a fifth depending on the musical context, but I'll mostly refer to it as a fifth. The bottom row of keys is a whole tone scale of such fifths. But crucially, this is not the same sample played at different pitches. All the keys have different samples, 
that were generated individually around a common center of gravity. And as a consequence, as we move up the scale, the highest notes will gradually fade away to nothing, while in the low end of the spectrum, new notes will gradually appear, so that by the time we reach the end of the scale, we're actually back exactly where we started. This is known as the Shepard illusion, or a Shepard scale, and in this way we can play what appears to be an endlessly rising or endlessly descending scale. Since we're moving in whole tone steps, we can only reach 6 out of 12 possible starting points on the equal tempered scale. The remaining 6 fifths are instead located on the second row of the keyboard, because of the shape of the computer keyboard, you can follow a zigzag path, like this. And one option would have been to arrange the fifths chromatically along this path. But it turns out to be more practical, and perhaps a little bit more elegant, to offset the second row in such a way that as we move along the zigzag line, we step through the circle of fifths. Now we can use these fifths and fourths as building blocks to create more complex chords. If we play a fifth, and the fifth that's two whole tones above it, we get a major seventh chord. And so you can just move this two finger shape to play a major seventh chord in any of the twelve keys. And because of the shepherd tones, a major 7th chord is equivalent to a minor 6th chord on the mediant, because it contains the same notes. If we now move the 2nd, 5th down by a semitone, we get a minor 7th chord. Which is equivalent to a major 6th chord. If we stack two fifths, we get a suspended chord, a sus2. But a C sus2 is equivalent to a G sus4. Right, so we've made two kinds of suspended chords, major and minor seventh chords, major and minor sixth chords, and pure fifths and fourths. That's already quite a wide selection, and we can create a lot of music using these chords. But in order to recreate that classic Amiga sound, we really need the basic major and minor triads. And for that we need to introduce another interval. There are several ways to go about this, but after experimentation I settled on minor thirds. So just as we have the fifths on the two lower rows, we have minor thirds on the two upper rows. If we combine a fifth and a minor third, we can make a minor triad. And if we combine the fifth with this minor third instead, we can get a major triad. Then we can stack two minor thirds to get diminished triads and even diminished seventh chords. And there are other interesting combinations like and horror clusters like For my next trick, I'm going to remove one of the fundamental assumptions of this design. Recall that in all these samples, the volume of an individual note is determined by how close it is to a pitch center, a center of gravity. And this is baked into the samples, and it ensures that all the chords have a consistent timbre and work well together. And I arbitrarily picked a center of gravity in the upper mids because that was the particular sound I was looking for. Well, on another day I might be looking for a different sound. 
And wouldn't it be nice if we could move the center of gravity at runtime in order to explore a range of timbres? It turns out that this can be done without adding new samples to the program. These two function keys will increase or decrease the sample playback rate in increments of a major third. But at the same time, all the key bindings are rotated two steps in the opposite direction to compensate by a major third. And in this way, all the chords remain in the same place on the keyboard, and only the timbre changes. I'd like to thank my little community of supporters on Patreon and Steady, who make these videos possible. There are links in the video description if you also want to be a part of that. And with your continued support, I'll go ahead and make some music videos featuring Padme and my other computer-based instruments. But until then, take care and keep up with the Commodore!